Welcome to the Required Podcast. Today's episode brings us um, Harry New. Uh, Harry New is business development consultant at Whitefin. And um, I'll rather than introduce you, Harry, um, tell us a bit, a little bit about White, what Whitefin do. Hi, Andy. Uh, thanks for having me on, by the way. Um, so, a bit of background into Whitefin. In a nutshell, we are a European compliance and payroll partner. Uh, specialising in the EU EFTA member states. So effectively, European payroll. Um, work with a lot of agencies, clients, assisting their contractors, ensuring they're compliant when they work in a European jurisdiction, in a nutshell. Um, you're quite a young company, but you've recently been acquired by Workwell. How's all that gone? Good. Good, yeah. I mean, it's been um, been a journey. Um, as you said, obviously, we're, we're a young company and... The acquisition, if anything, has just brought more opportunity and given us the, uh, I guess, the ingredients to grow uh, and to grow more aggressively than we already have. So it's been exciting so far, put it that way. Good to hear. So, Harry, you originally started in recruitment. So tell us a little bit about how you got into recruitment. And you know, did you grow up wanting to be a recruiter or did you just like everyone else fall into it? Well, I think it's every young boy's dream, isn't it, Andy, to be a recruitment consultant? So, uh, no, it was one of those things. I think I graduated uni. I'd been one of those people that did a course that probably had absolutely no bearing on what I was going to end up doing. What and I, I, I studied sports science, actually. Okay. Um, I wanted to be a, a, a PE teacher originally. And I think I got to my th third year and realised that maybe that's not actually what I wanted to do. Um, and I'd done some door-to-door -door sales when I came out of uni, sort of commission-only stuff, proper in the, uh, the the pure pure selling, I guess. And I think I bumped into sort of a friend of a friend's dad at a, a party, very successful guy, big house, nice car. What do you do? Oh, I run a recruitment company. Oh, that sounds good. Young keen to earn money and that's kind of how it happened and I actually just ended up getting my CV and calling through I think it was the recruiter Hot 100 just basically pitching my CV to people and then one thing led to another and then I ended up um, being recruited to join um, Earth staff so it kind of yeah absolutely fell into it. That's an absolute hire's dream when someone someone says those golden things it's like I'm inspired by someone I know um, I've done door-to-door -door sales and also I've literally called in, you know, I've got on the phone and, and done that myself. So, yeah, not surprised it was snapped up. Yeah, I think it was um, a great experience for sure. Um, and, you know, it's led to this, so I'm grateful for it. So you're Earth staff, then you went to JDR and um, then you took the um, role into um, another international management company so uh, what made you move from being a recruiter to being you know, payroll management specialist good question i think during the time i was in the sector in i started in oil and gas recruitment at Earth staff and you know it was when the market was booming and then there was the massive crash and i joined jdr and um, great agency uh, still good friends with um with the guy that, that owns it and runs it I just got to, a, I think, a little bit of a point with recruitment. I was probably a little bit burnt out and wasn't exactly sure maybe if that if it was for me. Um, and again, it was complete luck. I, I met up with some of the JDR guys for a beer after I left and I was introduced to um, the uh, CEO of Six Caps at the time uh, and I had absolutely no clue what payroll was because I was a perm recruiter. And then, again, one thing led to another and... The rest is history, really. Fantastic. So tell us um, what it was about Whitefin that um, attracted you. I think it was a couple of things. Um, opportunity, uh, the people and the vision, really, I I'd say were the three main things that excited me. At the time, um, not to go into too much backstory, but I'd been made redundant from a, a previous company I was working at. They had to sadly shut their London office. Almost overnight, actually. I remember it was the May holiday. We were in peak lockdown and we got told, you know, on the Thursday before the long weekend, by the way, you might not have a job next week. So it's like, okay, great. Um, and I'd, I was interviewing a bunch of places, had a really good recruiter. 
a couple of other management companies that were much more established that'd be going a lot a lot longer than Whitefin. And I think for me, it was just the opportunity to come in at the very beginning to work for two two brilliant guys with a great vision. And, and I just loved the way they wanted to build the company and some of the real sort of USPs and the way they wanted to structure it was just so different. I just bought into the, the vision and the opportunity from the start, you know, to come in at the beginning and help grow it. Yeah, what surprised me is just the amount of coverage you have in Europe. Um, and you know, most most organizations will do it through a partner or, but you've got entities pretty much in every, everywhere you need them. Exactly, and I think that was one of the real things that excited me. You know, I'd worked in the past at companies where it, it was outsourced to a partner and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a different type of business model. But for me, that was just such a silver bullet, you know, being able to do everything in house, being able to offer a range of different solutions, including local employment ourselves. So I think for me, that is definitely one of the real, real USPs, I'd say, for the business. So one of the things that um, you know, our listeners, our watchers of this, um, a lot of them will be UK companies that haven't gone into Europe yet and maybe haven't started European contracts. What's the biggest differences you see recruiters find between you know their traditional UK business and when they go into Europe? I think every country in Europe is is so different. There's certain nuances that may be fairly similar, but traditionally, if you're used to dealing with the UK, you're used to a very certain way of of operating with contractors, whether that be IR35 or if you're in construction, maybe you're looking at, at CIS, thing, things of that nature. And when you look at Europe, you know, if you're looking at the countries we cover, you're looking at 30 different jurisdictions with very, very different tax systems, different do's and don'ts. So I, so I think it really is just that it's such a, a wide range of, uh, of different situations you're going to encounter, different tax systems, different compliance legislation. So I'd say that's a big one, just a differentiation in each country. Do you think that puts off um, UK recruiters from doing that because it looks quite complicated and risky? Possibly. And possibly if you're used to doing things a certain way and you're just kind of your bread and butter and people don't necessarily like going out of what's comfortable sometimes um, and maybe what served you well. And I think maybe there might be a missing link in terms of the advice they're getting or, or just asking people that work in that industry, look, what do I need to do? What do I need to look out for? I think one of the things that I I found when doing European business was that there's probably not the same level of competition you get in the UK. So you know, the UK market is probably the most saturated in terms of, of recruitment agencies in the world. And actually the opportunities, you know, if you can crack Netherlands, Germany, France, Belgium, it's quite high and, and the margins tend to be you know, higher. It's not as commoditized if you get into those yeah, those those nice sectors. Definitely. Um, conversations I was having this week actually with a couple of recruiters I've known for years and similar sort of example, someone that was going into the German market, never never cracked it before. And I mean, the rates you're talking about for a, a mid to junior level person, he was just shocked by by how high they were. So I think the opportunity you raised that is absolutely there, definitely. If I were running a recruitment company and I wanted to go into one country in Europe, um, which one should I go to? It's a good question. What what industry are you in? Uh, a lot of our audience will be, let's say, technology recruiters. Tech. I mean, tech, somewhere like the Benelux is, is such a big hub, but so saturated. Um, I think we've seen much bigger hotspots in Eastern Europe, actually, um, which... So in the tech industry especially, and I think that's come a little bit from COVID actually, with the increase in remote working, that you have such a hub of highly skilled, very, very well trained um, personnel within the tech space, you know, in countries like Poland and Eastern Europe, um, Poland and Romania, sorry, that are very, very highly skilled and, and that remote working opportunity has, has certainly um, helped that. So I'd say definitely look at the Eastern European market. Um, Benelux, but also Scandinavia. We've seen a bit of an uptick in locations like Sweden, Denmark, in the tech space, um, certainly. So, yeah, I'd say Eastern Europe would be where I'd look at, for sure. 
That's probably one of the things COVID changed. So I guess previously you would actually be putting people into those countries. Now I'd imagine that you know folk in the UK and you know some of the you know, Netherlands, Germany are saying, can you hire us people from Poland? Can you hire us people from Czechoslovakia and and payroll them because they won't have an entity there. But with the skill shortage and let's be honest, the um, the uh, wage arbitrage. Um, are you seeing a trend for people hiring and effectively near uh, offshoring, near shoring to Eastern Europe? Definitely. I think that's been a massive trend. And if anything good has come out of COVID, then it's within the industry that we've seen and I've seen, it would be that. You know, it, it's massively opened up talent pools for recruiters as well, especially if you've got someone within tech, for example, that doesn't really need to be on site. For the client now, they see the benefit of not having that extra expenditure of maybe bringing someone over. You don't have to consider that a contractor might negotiate for expenses or a living allowance or anything like that. So, you know, they've figured out that actually we can hire this Java developer. We're a client based in Belgium. We can hire them in Poland or wherever, Latvia, Czech Republic, and, and they can do a fantastic job. And um, so I think it massively has um it expanded that and for us it opened up a whole new service line with the eor side because we've had a lot more um clients come to us actually and say look i, I found this person in portugal uh spain romania wherever um we want to employ them we don't have an entity and that's where that kind of eor side has come through as well so just just with my jargon busting hat on um eor stands for employer of record so not everyone knows these these terms so did you just want to explain that a little bit harry yeah of course so uh, an employer of record model or an eor um is effectively outsourced employment so it's where effectively we will provide an employed model for the worker but not traditional sort of paye model this would be where you have a salaried employee so let's take Spain, for example, because it's where our is. Um, we have a client come to us in the US and say, we found this worker. We want them to be employed in Spain. We don't want to spend money setting up an entity because it's one employee. Can you employ them for us? So what we would do is effectively have an open-ended contract with the worker. So effectively, they become an employee of Whitefin contracting solution. We pay them a fixed salary. We ensure that their employment contract has all of their employment rights in. So they'll have sick pay, paternity cover, um, holiday pay, termination notice in line with the law. So effectively, they become our employee. They then work remotely for the client, um, but they're effectively on an open-ended contract. So it is the outsourced permanent employment is probably the best way of putting it. How do you guys differentiate yourselves from the likes of Deal and Remote? You know, these, these great unicorn companies that have had you know millions and millions spent on them um so how do you win against those guys it's a good question and it's it's one that we've been um experiencing firsthand i think the biggest differentiator between us and deal is probably the sort of more boutique level of personal service what dealer and those companies are fantastic at is that obviously they have a, a lot of cash behind them right so they've been able to build um, very interactive um, platforms. So they're more of a, a fintech, uh, as it were, um, which is great for you know customers to be able to go on and, and, and kind of generate their own quotations and things. But I think what we may have um, that they don't is that level of personal service and customer care, um, you know, having that direct point of contact because a lot of these, especially with the candidate side, a lot of them will need some hand-holding and a little bit of love, especially if they've not done it before. You know, they're going to have questions. They're going to really want to be able to have a voice at the end of the phone that they trust. And that's something that we've seen that's really enabled us to compete with them because although we don't have the same tech yet um, as they do, we have that personal touch and that level of service. Um, yeah, the voice at the end of the phone, I think, is really important. Yeah, I had Rich Gibbard on the podcast um, last week or yesterday, depending when this goes out. Um, but we were looking at things like chat GPT and what it will replace. And it's still those sort of human elements. It's still that trust that, um, yeah, it, it does make a difference. And, you know, do you want to be employed by a platform or do you want to be employed by you know, people? And, and actually, 
I st you know, I, I, I've not got experience of the, of the platforms, but I guess there's there's a, there's a type of person that would be comfortable with one and a type of person that's very comfortable with the other. Yeah, definitely. And and you may find that there are those people as you just want to plug in and, and they're not really too bothered about having human connection. Um, you, but we've also found as well that, you know, you may have, um, for example, you may have a Portuguese national um, that isn't very confident in their English. Well, we've got in our back office, we've got a plethora of languages now. You know, we've got Portuguese, Italian, French, Spanish, obviously English. So having that ability, I think, to, to offer the, you know, the aftercare in their mother tongue sometimes can be a bit of a, a differentiator as well. But I think it just depends on the person. You're right, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing as it goes by. So I, I guess the, the the tech thing does matter. So do you find yourself, you know, doing just lots of groundwork for people as well, lots of quotations and, you know, effectively, is, is that part of just part of the sale that you have to do? Or or do you find that that builds your business? I think it's it can be a double-edged sword, uh, definitely. I think we've tried to find, and of course, that's what we're here for, right? To, to provide the financial illustrations for, whether that be for a recruiter or a contractor or, or for a client. I think we've tried to find the sweet spot where we're providing the illustrations at a point that's helpful, um, you know, rather than, and although we love helping and, and doing as many quotations as needed, rather than someone who just says, look, I've, I've pulled a job. Um, can you do me 12 simulations on this? Yeah. Maybe you're going to be that helpful for them or their candidates. So sometimes it can be, you know, we're, we're doing too much too early and sometimes it's too little too late. So I think it's trying to find um, that sweet spot really. But I think it will it will never be a, a situation where people aren't calling us for simulations, but we, we like to keep up, keep ourselves busy. So, yeah, it's good. Um, which are the countries that you've recently brought on and why did you bring those on? Good question. So a few of the most recent in terms of where we set up entities, Poland and Italy are two of the, the more recent. Uh, Cyprus as well, we've just done. Poland was driven by demand, really. We picked up a couple of big projects in the engineering space last year, actually, white collar, sort of senior engineering um, roles. And, and we built that project up to a fairly, fairly high number of runners. Um, and that kind of dovetailed into people coming to us saying, look, we actually need to employ people in Poland. Maybe we've got some blue collar workers that need to be employed and employed under certain conditions. Um, and then we started getting more EOR requests in Poland as well. Right. Yeah, we were doing, but also just through uh, through word of mouth. So I think that was driven by demand. Um, and Italy as well. I mean, same goes for Poland, really, but in terms of differentiating with our competitors, I, I don't know of any other international management companies, could be wrong here, that have entities in Poland or Italy. It's very, very rare. And I, I, we were having to turn away business in Italy a lot because we just didn't have the infrastructure to do it. So I think that's why we looked at those specifically to, to just keep adding a string to the bow, really. Um, and it's definitely our, our director's goal to eventually have entities in every European location. Um, which I think is a very healthy, uh, uh, healthy ambition. And we're, we're getting there, slowly but surely. But yeah, Poland and Italy, definitely the, the two newest and most unique. I think Italy is an interesting one. It's one of the biggest, certainly top 10, um, staffing you know, by revenue countries in the world. Yeah, as you say, it just seems really underserved. Yeah, it's in interesting. Why do you think that might be from a sort of a, a contracting perspective? I think I think a bit like France, it's quite uh, it's quite scary. So there's there, there's quite a lot of rules around employment. Um, it's very worker friendly. So I think people have looked at it and just gone for perhaps easier options. But then again, you know, it, it means that you know there are there are opportunities by you know doing things properly, you know, using a partner. Then so I guess it, it's one of those that was just never uh, just never really looked at. Um, certainly in my, my time, my, my previous employer, um, that it just sort of sat there as a, okay, it's a, it's a market opportunity, but actually it was never the, one of the ones that there was a real, let's go for it. 
Um, but but it's always surprised me because the numbers say otherwise. Um, or whether or not it's just a, a local market and you know just it, it's dominated by local firms. I, th I think you're spot on, and I noticed that when I did oil and gas recruitment back in the day. Um, we used to do some uh, business with some of the big uh, oil and gas companies, ENI, for example, the, uh, the national. And it just was such a perm dominated market at the time. And it sounds like it probably still is the same. You know, I think there's a great level of comfort at working at the same business for a long time. And I think what I've noticed a lot of a lot of freelancers there or a lot of employees there, I should say, that um are being approached about freelance jobs by agencies, they're scared. Um, you know, they've maybe paid a huge amount into a, a pension, they've got great unemployment benefits and it's Know, pulling the apron string and seeing if they're actually willing to take that leap and, and lose that but earn a lot more money it's it's that trade-off isn't it um I guess the quality of life there's not bad is it right so um maybe you, you, you would you would just jog along as you are yeah it's pretty pretty good so i can i can imagine so um last question um if you were doing recruitment again how would you do it differently knowing what you know now i'd do contract for a start um <laughs> i think um how would i do it differently why would you do contract i mean i i completely agree with your answer but I, i'm interested to know why well i think when i started in recruitment and i did perm it's, it was such a great time for the oil and gas market i think i remember i did my first deal maybe in my second month or my third month or something and then i think my second deal was like a 37k perm deal so it was just like mm -hmm market was crazy um and then suddenly it just nosedived um but i think my problem as as a perm biller i wasn't consistent enough to have really good earnings month to month and you know i saw some of the books that my, my friends were building um you know that some of the runners books and it, it was just just crazy but more moreover than that i think since working in payroll for seven eight years whatever it's been it's flown by you kind of building a runner where well, you are building a runner book, but you're on the other side of the fence. So I've gained a much more close appreciation for what it would take to be a contract biller. And and I just think if I had my time again, I'd I'd probably probably want to look at doing contract. Definitely. Yeah, I think I think not only consultants think that, sometimes owners think that as well. You know, when you build up those big permanent and direct hire businesses, you know, actually well, I could start a contract five years ago, think where we where we where we could be so yeah um so you'd start with contract what else would you do well in terms of um markets or industries or yeah just just what you do differently knowing what you know now um, and obviously you you still work with lots of good recruiters so i'm interested to know what 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 marks out a good recruiter these days versus what would you do differently um the reason i ask the question is um when i worked on technology and looked at all the technology that's available, um, you know, the search match, you know, the, all the stuff that made would have made my job as a consultant easier. I look back and I do things in a different way. Now, yeah, hindsight's an amazing thing, but um, obviously observing people who are doing it well now is really important. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think I try and live in my market a little bit more than I did. Um, I think my approach when I started in recruitment was probably a little bit too transactional um, and I was young and probably very naive and I was just chasing the next big perm deal uh, at the time. I don't think I was thinking about how to live and breathe my market place enough. And if you, if I look at some of the recruiters now that do that really, really, really well, you know, their, their LinkedIn presence is, is fantastic, but just their knowledge of the, the market that they operate in and, you know, the conferences they go to and, and, and just becoming more of a you know an absorber space you work in rather than just viewing it as where's my de next deal coming from actually living in and, and breathing the option of that market and I think that's something that since working and joining Whitefin that the guys here have really helped me develop and in terms of how we I've built relationships with agencies and, and becoming more of even more just an advisor, you know, people call me up a lot just saying, oh, how, what should I do here? It's not just, oh, I've got a deal for you. It's like, I'm looking at this. How would you do it? Or, or, or what would you advise? So, yeah, I think maybe just living in the market a little bit more and being a little bit more of an expert in, in your particular field. 
and um, rather than just thinking about you know how many deals uh, can I do and uh, being young and, and and focused on the wrong things maybe. Yeah, that's a really good answer and good advice then. Right, so Harry, um, if you've got international con well European contractors or European EOR opportunities, how can people find you? Good question. LinkedIn. You can always find me on LinkedIn. Um, I can always, I don't know if I can drop my details maybe on, on to you so you can share them on the pod or something, Andy. Yeah, but, yeah, um, we'll put them at the bottom in the comments. Yeah, so I've got many phones that never stop ringing, so you can always call me, email. LinkedIn's a good one. Um, WhatsApp, whatever, really. I'm, I'm always available, um, apart from during my honeymoon, because then I think my, my missus might actually leave me if I, uh, if I answer the phone then. <laughs> Yeah, I think the customers will let you off on that one. Well, Harry, it's been great. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, good luck in uh, conquering Europe and um, catch up soon. Thanks so much, Andy. And thanks for having me on. Cheers. Cheers.